So we're talking about some cardiac arrest physiology, try to make sense of some of the clinical data that has been coming out lately, uh, and uh, use this from some of the stuff that I've learned in my pig lab. So it's been about a decade now since I first met Phil. He's a 40-year-old man that was in cardiac arrest whenever I was introduced to him. The call had come out as chest pain. We get there, first responders had already started CPR. I attempted to intubate him. He bit the laryngoscope, teeth went everywhere, blood went everywhere, it was a mess. He bit the ET tube. We shocked him, I don't know, at least 10 times, amiodarone, lidocaine, gave him everything that we had. And 45 minutes later, we pronounced him dead while he was still biting the ET tube at the hospital. It's a cardiac arrest researcher named Lance Becker. He said one time, nothing makes you want tomorrow to happen today, like watching a patient die in front of you that you know you could save tomorrow. And that's whenever I started my cardiac arrest research lab. So what is it? What's the border between life and death? Um, most of us will describe this as pulselessness. I mean, that's the simple way to think of it. Do they have a pulse or not? The problem, though, is that we suck at checking pulses. We think we're good at it, but we're not. Paramedics in a cardiac OR, if you gave them 10 seconds, were only 15% accurate at being able to determine if someone had a pulse or not. If you gave them up to 30 seconds, they could get to about 50% accuracy, but they could never seem to exceed that. So basically, we can't tell if they're alive or dead. And that's the problem, because research is really muddy now. John Hill was an oral surgeon back in the 1800s. He was apparently a piss poor anesthetist as well, though, because he kept killing off his patients he was trying to take the teeth out on. And uh, he figured out that you could give inhaled ammonia, which is a powerful vasoconstrictor, to restore pulses in people that had lost their pulse. We later see Gottlieb use adrenal extracts to do this. We see Pearson and Redding talk about this in the dog studies, not all of which could be rep replicated. All of this to try to restore coronary perfusion pressure and get these pulses back. The problem, though, is, is that we know that this isn't necessarily cardiac arrest. This is all caused by anesthesia or asphyxiation in the Pearson and Redding studies. Okay? So does giving a vasoconstrictor restore pulse in someone with a low blood pressure? Yeah, absolutely. But does it restore pulse in someone with no pulse at all? We don't know. And that's the problem. If we can't lump these people into the correct categories, then how's our clinical data going to look? Well, it's going to look muddy, and that's what we have right now. We can't tell which cohort to put these patients in any more than about 50% of the time is what the reason data does when we add ultrasound into this to determine if someone truly is pulseless or not. So that's one of the reasons I think our clinical data is so bad and why we need to lean more on translational science. So we talk about this. Giving epinephrine will restore a pulse in someone that's hypotensive. But what does it do if they're dead? Well, now we need to look at cardiac arrest physiology to be able to answer that question. So in normal physiology, we have a pump that's in tune with the circuit. It's dynamic. It pulls a suction on the venous side. It squeezes a set stroke volume against the systemic vascular resistance. It's going to give you a certain amount of flow against that resistance, which generates your blood pressure. The problem is cardiac arrest is different. Now your pump is external to the circuit. You're applying a delta P, a difference in pressure between two points, the artery and the venous. You're applying a delta P external to the circuit, okay? It's not pulling a suction on the venous side anymore. Everything wants to reach something called mean systemic filling pressure, where the venous and the artery side equal the same pressure, and most folks about 25 millimeters of mercury, much higher than normal CVP. And that's the problem. Everything wants to go towards this pulse, then you're not pulling anything off by suctioning. All we're doing is applying a pressure to their chest. So we now have this ever-decreasing delta P throughout the duration of our CPR. And what do we do? we give something that increases resistance. So we're applying this delta P against the resistance, okay? And so what do we see if we look at carotid blood flow? We look at what actually goes to the brain. Well, we see a decrease in blood flow to the brain. In my research in my lab, that was about 60% decrease in blood flow to the brain, all while giving you a nice, pretty-looking mean arterial pressure, making you think you're doing a fantastic job. And that's the problem here. Pressure doesn't equal flow. We may think it does, but it does not. Pressure and flow are two independent variables. We're giving flow to this patient by our delta P, but if we decrease, if we increase the resistance, we're gonna decrease that flow. But what if we were to do something different? What if we were to try instead to give a vasodilator, something like sodium nitroprusside, adenosine, or levosimendan, something that's gonna actually dilate everything out? You have a small delta P, but you're gonna get more flow with that. The problem, though, is everything's dilated out. 
Now we need to control where this flow goes. So now we need to start talking about things like maybe abdominal binding or something like that to try to push the flow where we want it to go. This may even be a role for smaller doses of epinephrine to have splanchyment vasoconstriction. I'm not saying epinephrine's completely out. We just need to be smarter about when we use it and know why we were going to use it. Then we have this small delta P problem. How else can we augment this? Well, you see people like Keith Lurie and Dimitri Anopoulos are talking about head up CPR to try to improve venous drainage from the brain. And you see people talk about active decompression of the chest, the impedance threshold devices. The problem is a lot of folks that look at this, they look at the clinical data on this stuff and they don't see a benefit. It's because we're talking about incremental gains, half a percent, one percent here and there, these small, small differences because these pressure differences are so small. But all of this so far has only been talking about blood flowing around in a circle. It's missing another huge component of cardiac arrest. Okay? So Lance Becker liked to uh, discuss cardiac arrest in three phases, electrical, circulatory, and cellular or metabolic phase. And this essentially you can look at as a timer towards cell death. And this is why this is important, because if we don't save their cells, what are we saving? Well, nothing, just a corpse. Okay? And so that's why we need to start thinking about how we can modulate the cells. And this is something we can do, okay? We can affect the cells. We've sh known for some time that if you apply a small amount of ischemia beforehand, or a small amount of ischemia after the fact, or even a small amount of ischemia distal in a remote area, you can actually make the cells survive much bigger ins uh, insults than they normally would. And we can do this with drugs as well, notably nitric oxide, AKA sodium nitroprusside, adenosine, and levosimendan. These are things we can potentially think about. So this is where I think our greatest resuscitation uh, outcomes are gonna come from, is looking at how we can modify the blood flow that we do have on these patients, okay? Controlling where it goes, improving our delta P, these small incremental gains, doing better pit crew CPR out in the field, okay? We keep talking about the basics. It really is back to the basics. It's not necessarily just drugs. Head up CPR potentially may work. We don't know yet, but we need to keep looking at this. And the problem is, is we don't have the translational data out there yet to tell you exactly how to take the clinical data we're seeing, this muddy data, and use it. And this is what we need to do. We need to work better on understanding these small parts of the problem so that we can make sense of the data that is out there. Thank you. Smack Force News has uh, traveled across the ocean, and we're now reporting uh, live from Texas. Okay. In the U.S. Um, just uh, some question from our That's viewers. Kentucky. <laughs> Kentucky, apparently. <laughs> um, just uh, from the audience, um, we just want to know. Pseudo PA, um, organized uh, motion on ultrasound. Should we be doing CPR or should we not be doing CPR? I don't think that it's going to hurt to do CPR on somebody like this, but I consider ultrasound, I see cardiac activity on ultrasound to be the same as a patient having a pulse. And that's because I know that we're so bad with our digitometers. Okay, thanks. And then as a, as a reporter, I don't know the answer to this question, but um, uh, do piglets not need to have lateral CPR due to the shape of their thoracic cavity? <laughs> and the second part of that question is, where did the AHA get one milligram from? Okay, so the first question about piglets. Uh, yes, so we get specific size pigs so that we can do AP CPR using a Lucas device. They had to be very specific. It took almost a year to be able to get those right. Uh, so that was a very difficult thing. But yes, if you just have a random pig go into cardiac arrest in front of you and you wanna know what the best BLS <laughs> evidence is, um, and I am the expert in the room on, on pig CPR. If a pet pig dies, just give me a shout. And mouth to mouth? Yes. <laughs> mouth to mouth. Mouth to, mouth to snout. Mouth okay. to snout. Let's be anatomically correct. Uh, I would lay them on their side to perform CPR. Yes, that would be the, the go-to. Okay. What, okay. what is the size cutoff <laughs> so, <laughs> for our pet pig? <laughs> okay, so AP CPR for me, it was 80 pounds. That was perfect. If we could get them between 75 and 85 pounds, 80 pounds spot on, then you could do AP CPR using a Lucas device. So hopefully your piglet is 80 pounds. Okay. And uh, the one milligram was essentially pulled out of thin air, and that's the problem with this, is that we were looking at trying to increase ROSC, and the problem is that that's a competing goal to increasing neurological survival because we're not looking at the cells. We're not looking at what the cells are experiencing, and that's where we go wrong with this. We're trying to improve coronary perfusion pressures and get them to restart their ROSC, and that's what the Paramedic 2 trial and ROC trial and many other data have shown, is we're getting ROSC, but we're uh, killing their cells at that point doing that. And so we need to start thinking more like what Safar said and look at cardiocerebral resuscitation. 
At uh, Smack Force News, we are not into pulling things out of the air. Um, back to our producers in the studio, Kat Evans, Kentucky. <laughs>